um, localities, uh, Tomaslik, which is Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Wallas, and uh, lots of uh, great uh, trips, little side trips along the way. And so we did that for 18 years, uh, over 500 trips on the Columbia, way more miles than Lewis and Clark ever did. And then uh, also during that time, concurrently, we did nine years of guiding in Alaska, uh, about 10 trips a year. So I was still on the road about 25, 30 weeks a year, which you know sounds really cool until you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we ran our own tour business as well. And so that was only two weeks a year, you know, motor coach, deluxe coach, and staying in all the national park historic lodges with our clients. And that was always fun. But uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you get started in this? And on the boats, I would say, well, you know, the first boat I worked on, they had an open bar and they had to, or you have, to, you have to use your room key, you know, to, you know, charge your drinks. And uh, I'm still working off of a bar tab. So that's the next thing. But no, uh, the way I got started in this one, when I was 15 years old uh, in junior high, uh, I had an English teacher who got very ill, terminally ill, as it turned out to be. And uh, so we got a substitute teacher. Anybody in here ever substitute teach? Okay. What, what do high school, junior high, high school kids do to substitute teachers? Yeah, they, they chew them up and spit them out, right? Well, the fact that our, our full-time teacher uh, was, was dying of cancer, we later found out. Uh, the teacher that came in, the sub that came in, her name was Mrs. Medina. She was from Paris, France. She was old. She was like 44 years old. <laughs> And she had a very heavy French accent, and she was going to teach us all English. And so she did the easiest thing possible. She just said, I'm going to give you all, assign you a book report. And you got to read it, then do an oral and a written book report. And so she came up to me and uh, she asked me, I don't know why she picked me out, but she said, because I was very quiet. I'm a real introvert when it, you know, in real life. I do this all the time, but when I'm home, this stuff goes in the closet, and I'm done, you know. I don't even talk to anybody, but, um, except for my wife, <laughs> if I have to. And so uh, she, she said, uh, I, have you picked out a book yet? And I said, no, ma'am, I haven't. And she said, oh, I have picked out a book for you. I think you enjoy it very much. I don't know how she, you know, pulled the, this idea on me. But it was a book about the size of one of these right here. It was entitled Ishi, I-S-H-I. How many of you read Ishi? All right, that's more than people on the boat. And uh, here's the last of the California news, you know, a tragic story. And so she gave me this book, and, you know, what do you do when you look? Some of you are probably like me. What do you do? You go, not looking good. <laughs> no photo, no pictures, nothing. But I like the font size and it's basic. And so, and it's only, it's under 300 pages, so I'm good. But uh, this book, Ishii, had like four pictures in it, and they were sepia toned. And it was about this size book. And I thought, well, okay, Ishii. So I, I took it home on Friday. First book I ever read cover to cover. I also went through a box of Kleenex because it's such a sad story. So come back to school, we're gonna start doing the oral reports. And Mrs. Medina's standing up there. And I had read the book, I mean, it got under my skin, very much so. And uh, so she stands up there, I will never forget this day. She says, today, for something just a wee little bit different, we're going to start in the back of the room. And my last name is Weber. So when I was in school, everything was you know, alphabetical, all the way back, you know, Billy Anderson up here, and I remember back there. And I, I kid you not, my best friend, Drew Ziegelbauer, who <laughs> always sitting next to me, he was sick and he wasn't there. So it went from Z to W that fast. And the next thing I know, she's going to talk, would you please? And I just remember walking up to the front of that room, just petrified because you know, public speaking is like the number one fear of most people. And so I got up to the front of the room and I turned around and I faced, there was like 55, 60 kids in that class. And I faced that class and I just started to talk. And I wish it would have been recorded. This was supposed to be three minutes with no notes. I didn't even have time to scribble stuff on my hand. And so I just started talking about Ishii and uh, the story. And all of a sudden I heard a bell ring and I looked at the clock in the back of the room 
and I had taken the entire 45 minutes. And I know you find that hard to believe. <laughs> I'd taken the whole class hour. And, and so that kind of brought me back to the here and now. And as I looked over the room, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Even the guys with the Letterman jackets on, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> see you next period, man. It's so sad, you know. And, and everybody was, and Mrs. Medina, she's sitting there behind her desk with shoulders heaving, mascara running down her face. <laughs> everybody walks out of the room, and I'm standing there. I go back and gather my folders and my books, and I walked up to apologize to her. And I said, I am, I mean, I didn't have any idea. I took all this time and just kind of, and she's saying, please don't talk, please stop. And she's mopping her eyes and just kind of, kind of compose herself. So I just, I stood there and I started to apologize. <laughs> please, please. So I just stood there nice and quiet and she finally gained her composure. And she says, Todd, I want you to know that this is one of the most beautiful oral report I have ever heard. And I'm here to tell you, you do not have to do the written report for I could not bear to read it. <laughs> I haven't done a written report since 1972. <laughs> and so that book really got me started. Got me started on, and we lived out in the, the Southern California at the time, San Fernando Valley, when I was a little kid, you know, six, eight years old. And uh, no real American Revolutionary War history back there. I was born in Rhode Island um, at Naval Hospital, but then we moved out to uh, California when I was about six, and then stayed there for about eight years. So it just got too crazy, earthquakes and all that. But while I was there, uh, I got interested in you know, Ishii, the Native Americans, the fur trade, the mountain men, John Jacob Astor, Lewis and Clark, all these Western explorers. And I just started that one book, tripped my trigger, and got me reading that stuff. And what also got me interested is when I'd read about them shooting a flintlock pistol. Well, how does that work? Well, I'll build one. If you want to know how something works, build one. Then you know how it works. And so all the stuff that you see up here, uh, clothes, pretty much. Uh, I didn't, maybe, and I didn't make this. This is a friend of ours puts these together. But, uh, you know, the boxes, the guns, the knives, all the stuff up here, I've built over many, many years. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to come up to our place in Hidden Valley, we have a turnstile at the front door. It's $4 admission for seniors. <laughs> and uh, we got a nice room set up. You can see everything on display there. Okay. All right. So, a um, couple things I want to cover today. We're always talking about Lewis and Clark. So, we're just going to do um, uh, go through what happened to some of these guys because we don't have time to do it all. But uh, we will cover you know the main some of the main players of the expedition, and you're going to have to forgive me, Marley, because I, I did a little more research last night on uh, on the dog and uh, the Reverend Timothy Alden, who I think is quite reliable source. <laughs> what just because he's a Methodist? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so we'll see. There's, there's, there you'll find with some of the players, human and canine, there are some varied ends to their tails. And the dog only has one tail, but he just has a different kind of tail. Okay, so we'll talk about the Captain Meriwether Lewis. We're always talking about Lewis and Clark. So, what happens in They get back from the expedition, September 23rd, 1806. The, everybody's given double pay. So Lewis goes from $500 a year as a U.S. Army captain. And after that, you know, almost two and a half years of service, he brings in about $2,200 in pay, which was pretty substantial. Uh, he also gets 1,600 acres of land uh, for his service. Remember those letters I read between the two of them. If we are successful in achieving our goals, we know it's going to be hard, going to be hardships, fatigue. But if we are successful in pulling it off, there will also be rewards. So double pay, 1,600 acres. Uh, the men got double pay in 320 acres. And uh, 320 acres was worth about 100 bucks back then. So it was a pretty sizable amount. And so Lewis gets his, his pay, he gets his land, and then he also is awarded the governorship of Upper Louisiana. And so did you know there was an Upper and Lower Louisiana? Lower Louisiana is this right here, New Orleans. Just draw a line right around the circle right there. That's lower Louisiana. This is upper Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, kind of a, not a real balanced. Thing. So Lewis is going to be governor of this vast tract of land. Is this a job he's well suited for? 
Not at all. He, he is not a pencil pushing office guy. He would rather be you know, out on the trail and living the life that he has had for the last two and a half years. So he gets that job, but Lewis, when they get back in 1806, for the, almost the entire next year, he's hobnobbing around on the East Coast. You know, he's living the life, he's living large, so to speak. You know, he's, he's a celebrity. Everybody wants to invite him to parties and, you know, and he's really living it up. Uh, Lewis did have a problem early on as a young man in the military with uh, alcohol. You know, he almost got uh, bumped out of the army for being drunk and disorderly. Uh, he uh, challenged a, a officer to a duel, which was illegal in the army. And he used very harsh language, which got him in a lot of trouble and almost got him uh, bounced out of the military. He called his commanding officer. No, I'm sorry, I know we got some kids here, but he used the R word. Now you got to think of the time period here. You know, 1801, and he went up to his officer in a drunken stupor and said, you lousy, crummy, rascal. <laughs> and he said, sir, you are front with such language. And so he almost got kicked out of the army because you called, you could, that was a hanging offense to call somebody a rascal. You know, wow, times have changed just a little bit. And so, uh, so Lewis has this history. He also has the history of being a melancholy and hypochondriac. Uh, his, his father had it, uh, and it was just a family uh, kind of ailment that uh, he was just all over the board. When he was on, he was on. But when he was off, he spiraled to the depths. And so he gets back, he gets this job. He spends a lot of time hobnobbing back here. And then when he finally does make it to St. Louis, almost a year later, there's an undersecretary, like an assistant governor, lieutenant governor, that has taken, has filled in the spot for him. His name is Frederick Bates. Now, if Lewis would have played his cards a little differently, but here, just picture this. Lewis is, he's the governor. He hasn't been there for a year. He walks into his office in St. Louis. Frederick Bates is sitting there. He's been taking care of business for almost a year and doing a bang up job. Lewis walks in and says, and you, you are, sir? Frederick Bates, uh, you're in my chair. Uh, that's your desk over there, clerk. Get out of my seat. And so had he, you know, what could he have said? He could have said, hey, Fred, Mr. Bates, nice to meet you. I hear you're doing a great job. I want you to bring me up to speed on everything that's going on here. But he, he just totally annihilates the relationship day one. And so from that point on, they're adversarial, just tearing each other down and editorials and just it gets nasty. Lewis comes back. He also has is spurned by the affections of two women because again, he's mercurial. He's all over the place emotionally. Uh, and so he's, he's also still suffering from alcoholism, malaria, and probably syphilis at this stage, you know, secondary or tertiary syphilis, which kind of messes with your brain. And so he is not a happy camper to use the words today. So Lewis um, is not the picture of health mentally, physically, emotionally. So he starts getting in these fights with Frederick Bates, and then he gets a letter from what is called the IRS, from the federal government, the accounting office. And the accounting office says, you know what? You went a little bit over budget. Remember we talked about that? 2,000% from 2,500 to 50 grand. He wrote almost 2,000 drafts. Uh, today we call them IOUs, checks. And uh, people could, at trading posts and other places, could take those drafts to the, any trading post or U.S. military post and get reimbursed. Lewis wrote 1,989 checks. And he was just writing them and just tearing them off like mad. So they said, well, he went way over budget. We need to call him in for an accounting. And also, um, he had been, uh, his character had been assailed by Frederick Bates and others. And they said, he is no gentleman. Oh, you don't say that to a gentleman from Virginia, you know? And so Lewis says, you know, I'm going to go back and clear my name. Now, I think one of the things that might have tipped off the government um, accounting office was one of the last checks he wrote was to his dog. <laughs> <laughs> we all hear about the story, right? People put their cat on their 1040, you know, as a dependent. You know, he wrote a check to his dog because he said, hey, you know, the dog caught squirrels. The dog alerted the camp to a bison coming crazy, running through the camp night, through from bears, uh, Indians sneaking up on us. I mean, the dog played, you know, a great role as a hunter, protector, and all that. And uh, so I said, I'm going to write, cut him 50 bucks. 
And so when they probably saw that, they said, check me now, who's this, who's this semen? Is that a private? Is, is it a corporal? What is it? No, it's my dog. So that one might have kind of tipped the scale a little bit louder. So anyway, Lewis is on his way. He's, he figures he's going to get on a boat and go down to St. Louis, uh, from St. Louis all the way down here to New Orleans, and then get on a boat and go all the way around here to Chesapeake Bay and up into the capital city. But uh, when he gets down here, anybody been to Fort Pickering? Anybody been to Memphis? Yeah, that's Fort Pickering. Used to, it was Memphis is now Fort Pickering. And uh, there's a little military post. And there, uh, Lewis had an old military friend because Lewis had spent a lot of time out here on the Ohio, you know, prior to the expedition. And so uh, when he gets to Fort Pickering, his old buddy, uh, his name is Stoddard, uh, sees him and he goes, buddy, you're a wreck. He'd been self-medicating himself with laudanum, with uh, Peruvian barks for his malaria, alcohol. He'd been bleeding himself. This guy was, he was taking the dive when he was not in good shape. So uh, they put him under house arrest right here at Fort Pickering. And they keep him there for two weeks. And he dries out. And he's looking pretty good. He's, he's on the rebound. And he said, okay, I got to continue on. But now he's two weeks behind schedule. It's in October. The river is low and slow. He's afraid he's going to contract malaria again. So instead of continuing down this slow Mississippi River all the way down to here, he asked his old army buddy, can you sell me a horse on credit? And you just you know, do that. And he says, sure. So he gives him two horses and a hundred dollars. That's like two grand today. So that's like if you're one of your good friends came to you in this condition I just told you about Lewis, drunk, crazy out of his mind, deranged, and he said, Larry, can I borrow your Cadillac and 20 grand? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> Probably not, you know, most people would go, no. So, uh, but he, he does it because he's an old army buddy. So he gets the, uh, gets his horse. He's also accompanied by two other people. We don't have time to go into all those details. And they're going to accompany him on the Natchez Trace, an old 400 year old trail, French trail. And there he's going to work his way up here and then over Appalachia and into the capital city. Now, Lewis is, again, just like on the expedition, he's always out in the lead. You know, Clark was always behind him on the boat. Lewis was the one always out in front hunting and seeing everything first time. And so the same way he outdistances the men, his horse with his luggage runs off and he says, fetch my horse. I'll stop at a roadhouse uh, when I find a roadhouse that is run by white people because they're on the Chickasaw Nation. And he says, so I'm going to stay at a B&B, &B, you know, some nice little place run by white folks on the Chickasaw Nation. So in a little place in uh, Western Tennessee, uh, the town, the closest town, was called Hohenwald. Uh, he um, and it's still there. He just he stops at this little place called Grinder's Stand that is run by Mrs. Priscilla Grinder and a couple of kids. Her husband's out, and uh, so Lewis shows up, and she doesn't know who he is, but he is well dressed. He's wearing the latest fashion of the day. He is well heeled with new boots. He's got a post chase hat that was the latest rage, the style hat, just in from France. He had a beautiful set of pistols, a beautiful dagger. He had all this stuff, a Louis Vuitton luggage. You know, he had the whole package. And she doesn't know who he is, but she knows he's somebody of means. She doesn't know he's the governor of Louisiana, that he was Thomas Jefferson's personal secretary and was the co-captain of the expedition that went to the West. She just thinks, well, it's somebody, and he's staying here at my place. So she fixes him some, a meal, and he goes off. And she said he started ranting and raving like a Philadelphia lawyer. Just, you know, veins poking out of his neck and just super agitated. And then he calmed down. And it was really bothering her because he was scaring her children because he was just going all over the place. And so then uh, they find his horses, his other men come along, they sit down for another meal, and Lewis goes off again. And the men just don't even break stride eating. And Mrs. Banger's going like, he did that once before, and they go, oh yeah, he does it all the time. He's fine. He's fine. Well, he wasn't fine. He was at the end of his room. And uh, so after the meal, he calms down again. He goes out on the porch of uh, this little dog trot uh, style house. He's got his whiskey. He's got his pipe. He sits out on the porch, and uh, he's looking to the west. And people, you know, what was he thinking? And I can tell you, I think I know pretty much what he was thinking. He was thinking, Bill Clark. Where are you when I need you? Because they were a great team. 
William Clark had other business. He'd already married, started a family, and he couldn't accompany his friends to Washington. Had Lewis had better company accompanying him to Washington, I said he'd still be alive. You know, he wouldn't have ended his, his life that night. And so, uh, but no, he, the people who were with him were not really invested in him. One was just a manservant, the other was a, a U.S. Marshal kind of guy who was kind of shady too, kind of bad cop scenario. And so uh, he really didn't care. And so Lewis finally he's sitting there, he's getting pretty inebriated. And then he goes to his room, closes the door. And in the wee hours of October 11th, the morning of October 12th, they hear two shots ring out from these large uh, North and Cheney 1799 pistols. These are 69 caliber smooth bore. So this is basically a 12 gauge pistol. So those of you familiar with a 12 gauge shotgun with a slug in it. Okay, that'll take down a grizzly. And so Lewis has two of these. He asked his man sir, to bring me my pistols and my ammunition. Now, how many of you would hand those things over to someone in that condition? You know, I mean, it's just ludicrous. But he was a servant, so he hands him his pistols and his ammunition, and in the wee hours of the morning, two shots rang out. Now, nobody was there to witness it, uh, but they broke the door down, and Lewis was sitting on the floor, leaning up against the bed, a wound to his head, because they figured the first shot was probably, these are, these are awkward pistols to hold that way. So the first shot, he's pretty drunk, these are heavy, Boom, and he knocked off some of his you know, scalp and you know, just kind of a serious wound, but not fatal. So then he grabs a second pistol, and again, trying to hold it to his chest, he holds it at an angle and fires through his lung. And uh, he's, he's laying there bleeding out when they come in. And Mrs. Grinder is beside herself. You know, and Lewis looks up at her and his purported last words were, woman, fetch me a glass of water and heal my wounds. And the next thing he was supposed to be said was, why is it that my heart is so hard to die? And this guy was hard to stop. And so those of you that may have read that Stephen Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage, that title, Undaunted Courage, just flip those words around, courage undaunted, comes from Thomas Jefferson's eulogy of his friend, personal friend, Virginia gentleman and secretary, uh, Thomas Jefferson, speaking of Lewis. And he said, she possessed courage undaunted stopping at nothing but the impossible. So unfortunately for Lewis, you know, he was in the, the spiral of, you know, a manic depressive state. He, you know, was under a lot of influence of drugs and alcohol that was readily available. And he didn't have good people with him that cared about his well-being. And they just let him slip through their fingers. Now there's other people that say it was murder. Uh, you know, you're always gonna have these controversies, you know, just think about JFK and the grassy knoll. Was it one shot? Was it two shot? Two shooters, one shooter. You know, I mean, no, we're never going to know. And uh, so Lewis is buried right there at the grinder's stand in Hohenwald, Tennessee. And uh, his grave is uh, a big square base. And then it has a cylindrical column that goes up. And then it's broken off halfway to signify that his life was indeed sheared off midlife. He was 35 years old. This is only three years after the expedition. You know, he was at the apex. He was at the pinnacle of his career. The world was his oyster, so to speak, and, and he just couldn't hang on. So that is the end of Meriwether Lewis in October of 1809. And um, it's just a tragic end for a bright and shining star. And so I, I really, you know, every time I relate that story, you just wish, God, why didn't you just have somebody there that really cared about it? You know, there were so many people that could have jumped into the gap there. Now, what about his dog? For a long time? Uh, if the dog had been there, he wouldn't have done it. <laughs> the dog pulled the trigger. They got those big paws. <laughs> no, his dog, they're feeling to say that the last time the dog is mentioned in the journals is mid-July of 1806 at Great Falls, Montana. And Lewis writes, my dog is enduring all the hardships that we have. They were in a heavy swarm of mosquitoes. He said the dog is howling with the mosquitoes. Uh, he says, and we are even choking as we breathe and we choke on mosquitoes in our throat. So the dog's face was covered with skeets. The, the grass called needle and thread grass uh, was penetrating his fur and sticking him. And he was like under attack by, you know, it was just, the dog endured everything the men did. 
but that's the last time he's, you know, that was in July 15th, 16th of 1806. The trip is over September 23rd. So just two months later, the trip's over. And there's no more mention of the dog in the journals for that duration from July to September. And people say, well, maybe the dog didn't make it. No, had the dog not made it, somebody in that 1.2 million words recorded on the expedition would have written, our dog died. The dog ran off. We can't find it. Or he got killed by a bear. Or he got whatever. Somebody would have, would have said something. And so for a long, long time, they didn't even know what the dog's name was because the way Lewis wrote, they thought it was Scammon. They didn't know it was Seaman. They thought it was S-C-A-M-M-O-N. And just because that long cursive with an ink and quill. So anyway, what happens to the dog? Uh, there's a, a man by the name of the Reverend Timothy Alden. And uh, he, he's a Methodist. He started Allegheny College in 1817. And uh, he was a man of letters. Boston Historical Society, New York Historical Society, New York Antiqu Antiquities Society. This guy was well-versed. And uh, he had an unusual hobby. Uh, he would go all up and down uh, through the eastern seaboard and col you know, previous colonies. And he'd take paper into cemeteries and would rub uh, gravestones. And write down the epitaphs, and he would he made a book of curious epitaphs, engravings, and notes on these various um, gravestones that he found. Some of them, Nadine and I spent a lot of time in England with our other son, and we go to these thousand-year-old cemeteries, but in these churches way up in North Yorkshire, and some of the poetry, these these full sculptures of the people buried in the church, and these a sculpture of the woman in marble, sticking you know, like a bas relief, and the words. I mean, our little granddaughters are reading it; they're crying. You know, I mean, it's just so moving. And so this guy, this was his hobby. And now uh, he's well-respected. And so what happens after Lewis dies, William Clark gets a lot of his personal effects. And so he gives those. Both Lewis and Clark were high-degree Masons. And so they gave William Clark, we have a letter that says he gave these things to the Masonic Lodge in Alexandria, Virginia in 1814. And it doesn't give a list of what he gave, but he gets a letter back saying, thank you for giving us these things for our, our fledgling infant museum that we're starting here. Unfortunately, that museum burned down in 1871 to the ground with everything in it. And so, but one of the things that was in there, and I took the time to write this out long ago because I just didn't want to paraphrase it, but the Reverend Alden, he heard about this dog collar. And it was at the Alexandria Museum at this uh, Masonic Hall. And so he, he wanted to go down and, and see it. And because uh, he thought that was kind of an interesting little bit, it had a brass plaque riveted on. You know, Newfoundlands are a big dog. So the collar was probably like a pie plate diameter with a plate riveted onto it. And uh, the, the plate said, I um, have some other notes here. This is basically uh, quote, uh, entry number 916. This is out of a five volume set. He says, I'm the greatest traveler of my species. My name is Seaman, the dog of Captain Meriwether Lewis, whom I accompanied to the Pacific Ocean through the interior of the continent of North America. Copied off of the collar. Next to the collar, there was like a hang tag, you know, a little more additional information. And this is what the Reverend Alden wrote down. He didn't write this. This was written in the display case, as I understand it, to go along with the collar, a little more information. And he wrote this in 1814. This is just five years after Lewis's death. Uh, the foregoing, what I just read off the collar, was copied from the collar in the Alexandria Museum, which the late Governor Lewis's dog wore after his return from the western coast of America. The fidelity and attachment of this animal were remarkable. After the melancholy exit of Governor Lewis, his dog would not depart for a moment from his master's lifeless remains and when they were deposited in the earth, no gentle means could coerce him from the spot of internment. He refused to take every kind of food which was offered him and actually pined away and died with grief upon his master's grave. So that's a very touching story. And if it's true, it's very plausible. Uh, on several occasions, uh, when I did do these presentations up on the river, I had two people that breeded, that were Newfoundland breeders. And they said, absolutely, those dogs, they are loyal to a fault. We can absolutely see a dog, a Newfoundland doing that. And if I read back through history of Newfoundlands last night, and they, that is one of their strongest traits is the loyalty to their owners. 
And so uh, it's a very plausible story. Is it what really happened? Nobody really knows for sure. But there's no mention of the dog after that incident, after Lewis's death in 1809. And the dogs back then, they probably lived about eight to 10 years. So the dog could have easily lived, you know, you know, about three more years after the expedition if he'd been young when Lewis bought him in Pittsburgh. So we'll never know. But uh, if you get more Lee's books, he has a little different twist on the end, which is really well done because she uses uh, George Shannon, who is the youngest member of the expedition. No, I won't give it away, but <laughs> the dog ends up with another expedition member. And so Lewis kind of, will you watch my dog while I go take care of business in Washington? Okay, so that's, there's, so that you got to read and decide for yourself. Okay, fair enough? Fair enough. Fair enough, okay. But you know, nobody mentions the dog at Grinder's stand. No, no, nobody mentions the dog in depositions. But then again, Mrs. Grinder changed. She had three depositions and every three was different. And the, and the way they know that now is because of these things right here, this computer. On one of her depositions, Mrs. Grinder said, it was a full moon. And I saw two men come off the Natchez Trace and get into the window. So some computer geek went, October 11th, 1809, what was the phase of the moon? It was a new moon, not a full moon. It was pitch black and her mercury vapor light, motion light was out. <laughs> it wasn't working. So yeah, so right there, that blows her story out when she said, oh, the full moon. I could, I could see these men clearly. Mm, I don't think so. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, like I say, a lot of things change and uh, things have happened over the years and we'll never know. They want to exhume the body. That's never going to happen because it's in a large cemetery now. They'd have to dig up all this stuff and the government has no money to be doing that kind of thing anyway at this time of day, at this time of the season. So anyway, that's, uh, that's Lewis and the dog. Now what about Captain Clark? What happens to him? He comes back, he gets his double pay, he gets his 1,600 acres, and he is given the job of the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, what we today call the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So he is the first Superintendent of Indian Affairs, and uh, because he's, he's very compassionate towards the Indians, he knows that the expedition that he helped co-lead out to the Pacific, they encountered over 50, 55 different Native groups, and he knew that the expedition he helped to co-lead was going to forever change their life. If it hadn't been Lewis and Clark, it would have been somebody else. You know, the country was on the move west. Lewis and Clark just happened to be the point then that got this whole ball rolling. So he's appointed the governor of, uh, or the superintendent of all the Indian affairs. St. Louis, as far as the Indian population is concerned, they nickname it the Red-Headed Chief's Town. William Clark was, Lewis was about my size, about 5'11", 175 pounds. Clark was just a little taller, you know, about 6'1", 6'2", redheaded. And so they called St. Louis the redheaded chief's town because he was, uh, he was very fair, wanted to make sure that you know, as more settlers went out, that they weren't getting their land stolen and their, all their game run off and all that. So he was very concerned about their well-being and they sought him out. So he was a very even-tempered, uh, fair individual. He marries, as soon as he gets back from the expedition, uh, to Julia Hancock, not related to John Hancock, but what Hancock was a common name back then. So he marries Julia Hancock. She's like 12 years younger than him, which was pretty standard fare back then. Uh, they have their first child is a son, whom he names Meriwether Lewis Clark, which really messes up genealogy.com because now you, you know now you have those two family names blended, but it's only by name and not by blood. So Meriwether Lewis Clark. Uh, he goes on to live, uh, you know, he gets married. He has a son, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr. Now, Jr. doesn't do too well. He, he's got a ride on the family financial coattails, and, uh, and he doesn't really amount to much. His mother dies when he's young, so he's sent to Kentucky to live with two uncles. And the uncles raise him. Now, the whole Clark family is into horses. William Clark was a big uh, horse racer, uh, horse breeder. Just think Jay Leno but horses, okay? He had a massive stable and he kept a lot of horses and kept their bloodlines very uh, distinct. And so Mary, his grandson, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., raised by his two uncles, when he became of age, they sent him to England to learn how do they do the horse racing over at Ascot and these places in Europe. We want you to see a you know, really good circuit and how we can set something up here and set up uh, horse racing here in Kentucky. 
His two uncles, their last name was Churchill. Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby. So William Clark's grandson, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., is responsible for starting the Kentucky Derby. And that whole thing, the two spires at the end of the grandstands, the Churchill spires, that's all the Clark family. So it's just one of those little asides. But anyway, William Clark will die at 68 years old. Natural causes, 68 was pretty good for back then because about 40, 45, you were getting close to the end of life. So at 68, natural causes, uh, well beloved by family and, uh, and friends at his funeral in St. Louis. He's interred at the Bell Fountain Cemetery in St. Louis, one of the largest monuments there, and, uh, and went out very gracefully and well loved and respected. So he did quite well. Uh, he did run for governor, but he, he lost out because they thought he was too soft on the Indians, because he was too concerned about their welfare. Said, no, he's an Indian lover, we're not going to vote him in to be governor. So um, I did want to pass this around. When I was talking about Lewis, this uh, this friend of mine, Michael Haynes, did a lot of these illustrations for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, 2003 to 2006. And we were wearing a similar outfit, you know, the, the blue shirt and the ascot and the pistol and dagger. And this is Mrs. Priscilla Grinder. Here's Lewis on his borrowed horse, pocket full of money, a little Edgar Allan Poe-ish feel of the ravens, you know, a portent of things to come. So uh, Michael Haynes did a wonderful job on portraying accurately, you know, the uniforms and the clothing of the day of the expedition and everything around it. He, he's had a beautiful book out. A lot of his artwork is in the National Galleries now because of his, uh, he just did so much for the, the Bicentennial event. Uh, so now what about uh, the young lady here? Sacagawea, Sacagawea. You can call her whatever you like. You can call her Jamie, you can call her Sacagawea. Uh, and you say the girl, <laughs> make it easy. What happens to her? She's buried in two places too. You know, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of this that happens in this expedition. One place has her died at almost 100 at uh, Lander, Wyoming, the Shoshone Wind River Reservation, and others have her died on the North Dakota, South Dakota border at Mo Bridge uh, at about 24, 25 years old. So what happens? She gets back from the expedition, remember August of uh, 1806, they muster out the Charbonneau family. Clark and his men and Lewis, they all go down the river, but he writes her a letter and he says, I will raise your son. When he is weaned, bring him to me. So that's what happens when uh, little Jean Baptiste is five years old about. Uh, they come down to St. Louis about 18, mm, 11, 10, 11. They come down and they knock on William Clark's door and said, here he is. And William Clark adopts him. Now William Clark sets them up in a house on his own property. They had quite a bit of land. And he sets them up with hogs and cattle and chickens and horses. But he says, uh, Charbonneau, is, he's just, this is not his lifestyle. And so I just want to read you a couple of things here where it says uh, about, uh, where is it here? This is where she dies. Let's see. Here we go. After they leave their, their son off, and uh, they, they live in St. Louis for a little while. Charbonneau just doesn't take to it. He's a rolling stone. So they, they get on a, a barge going back up the river to work at a trading post up on the upper Missouri River. They have a Scottish uh, journalist on that trip. His name is Henry Breckenridge. And he just happens to be on the barge. There was a lot of Europeans coming over to America at this time to see the American West before it disappeared. Artists, journalists all came out to record it. Guys like uh, George Catlin, Alfred Jacob Miller, Carl Bodmer, Prince Maximilian, all these people came out to see it before it was gone. And so Henry Brackenridge, he's on the same boat. And this is what he writes in his journal that day. We have on board, uh, this is in April of 1811. We have on board a Frenchman named Charbonnet, 44 years old approximately, and his 23 year old wife, an Indian woman of the Snake Nation both of whom accompanied Lewis and Clark to the Pacific and were of great service. The woman, a good creature of a mild and gentle disposition, was greatly attached to the whites, whose manners and airs she tries to emulate. But she has become sickly and longs to revisit her native country. Her husband also has lived many years among the Indians and has become weary of civilized life. So she's going back up the river. They stay at this little trading post uh, called Fort Manuel Lisa, which was just a little log trading post right on the North South Dakota border on the Missouri River. It is now underneath a big reservoir, Lake Hawaii. So 
the site is gone, but it's you know under a big reservoir there of the Missouri. And so uh, there's a they're staying there for a while, but this is a trading post. It's just too far out there. It's too hard to protect, too hard to make it business work. And so the clerk there, his name is John Luttig. And uh, Mr. Luttig, on December 20th, 1812, after just about a year of Chicago and her husband being back up on the upper Missouri, he says, December 20th, 1812, he writes, this evening, the wife of Charbonneau, a snake squaw, died of a putrid fever. Again, she was a good and the best woman in the fort, possibly the only one. Uh, aged about 25 years. She leaves a fine infant girl, Lisette. So she's had another child by Charbonneau, um, assumably, and uh, but now she's gone. Uh, they can't keep the fort open. It's just too hard. And so they decide to abandon the fort and go down to St. Louis. This is in December. Going down the Missouri River in December, and here's the clerk of this place with a new baby. So they, they make it down to St. Louis and they knock on William Clark's door and go, you adopted her son, here's a little girl, you want her too? So we have all the records of the adoption papers, schooling papers, school supplies, boarding, uh, room and board and all that of Jean Baptiste, but nothing on Lisette. She falls through the cat cracks of history almost instantly. And uh, it was interesting because I, I had a woman on a trip that was a, um, a translator, French English translator uh, for the United Nations. And uh, she was she came up to and talked with me afterwards because I didn't realize how much French emphasis there was with the Lewis and Clark expedition with the, the people that they hired and you know and there's smatterings of it. And she said, your French accent is delightful. She says, I just want to tell you there's just a couple things that you need to change. And I said, okay, well, I'm all ears. And uh, she said, number one, his name is not Jean Baptiste. It's spelled J-E-A-N and Baptiste, but it's pronounced Jean. And you don't pronounce uh, the P in Baptiste. It's Jean Baptiste Charbonneau. And I said, okay. So the next day I was at Fort Clatsop and I got all the rangers in it in turfs around. And I said, okay, I got this from the top. It's not because they were all saying it wrong too, you know. So we all made ourselves say it like 20 times. So it's the Jean Baptiste. So that and, uh, and I said, and it said that Lizette uh, died as Le Infant, L apostrophe E N F A N T. And she says, that's pronounced Le Fon. And I said, so what is Le Fon? And she says, Le Fon is a, usually, in this case, a girl from birth to the age of accountability, most likely from birth to when she hits her first menstrual cycle. So, 14, 13, 14, somewhere in there. So it's not when we think of an infant, what do we think of? A babe in arms, right? Now we've got all the words, right? We got infant, toddler, terrible twos, you know, all, we've got all those things, but the phone in French means from birth to about 14 years old. So she could have died anywhere in that range, but there's just no, no record of her. Beautiful name, uh, probably would have been an amazing young lady, but uh, she didn't survive long enough to make a difference in, uh, in history. So that's, uh, that's what happens to her, to her niece to Lisette. So now she's, uh, so Conawea is buried. They inter her body right here on the North South Dakota border, Moat Ridge, and uh, they head down the river. Now, another story has her buried right here outside of Lander, Wyoming, on the Wind River Reservation, living to be almost 100 years old and buried with her two sons. One, Jean-Baptiste, and uh, the other one, um, Basil, thank you. Um, we have no, there's no historical record of a son named Basil. So who knows, but she's buried in two places as well. And uh, her bones are now scattered from Mow Ridge all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So at 23 years old, uh, a lot of, I had talked to a lot of doctors and they said she probably died of pelvic inflammation, probably you know, after the birth of the set and uh, had complications, you know, from venereal disease and pelvic inflammation, and that probably took her life. So again, not a lot of health care for women on the frontier when you're the only woman there at the fort, right? So that's a tragic end of a, a very pivotal young woman, you know, on this expedition. And I always like to point out that, you know, people say, well, they couldn't have done it without her. Well, they couldn't have done it without George Fiore. They couldn't have done it without this individual. Now, no expedition is made up of one person. It's a team effort that pulled this whole thing together. You know, the guys that sewed all the clothes, they don't get mentioned by name. 
Otherwise, those and Clark would have been frozen out in the wilderness, you know, without these guys just sewing away all the time. And uh, so she was very important to the expedition, to be sure, with, uh, you know, getting them horses. She actually did it on two occasions, lots of their own people, lots of the Walla Wallas, and, um, you know, food and things, uh, foodstuffs and, and feed for the horses. And just, I think, in my mind, you know, I've done a lot of river trips with just guys, you know, like 16 guys floating down the Grand Canyon or San Juan or something. And when it's all guys, how many of you guys go on hunting trips or river trips with, with just guys? Right. And, and what is the conversation around the campfire? It's it's can get a little racy. Now, if your wives are along, the conversation is a little different, I'm guessing. Right. So when you have a woman on a trip, it just kind of tempers and changes everything. And I would like to think that somewhere along this line, because William Clark did have an affinity for this little boy, and I would like to think that somewhere along the line, William Clark had him on his shoulders, you know, given, hey, J.D., let me take that, you know, here, lugging that kid. And I could see uh, maybe Patrick Gass, you know, carving him out, you know, a little toy dugout to pull along down the river as they floated down the Yellowstone. I mean, none of that's recorded, but, you know, there's a lot of people who keep journals that don't write down, oh, we went on a family vacation. It was a 69 Ford Ranchero with a, you know, 389. No, people don't write that kind of stuff down. But you know, there's there's details that we're, we'll never know. But I, I'm just assuming from these guys were together for almost two and a half years. There was a lot of you know mixing going around and a lot of uh, information that wasn't written down. And so I, I like to think of those moments that it was probably some pretty tender moments along the trail, especially the Chicago we had on board. So uh, now, what about Jean Baptiste? He's buried in two places too. <laughs> One is what I just told you right here, next to his, his hundred year old mother in you know, central Wyoming, it's not. Uh, the other one is he's buried up here in, um, in Southeast Oregon in the Jordan Valley, little place called Danner, Oregon. And uh, so what happens to him? William Clark adopts him, true to his word. And when he adopts him, uh, he, uh, his wife, Julia Hancock, she said, well, I understand, you know, your affinity for this little guy and you, you like this mom and she was a big help, but he's not living in this house because he's a half-breed, not with our children. So he was boarded and we have uh, his boarding papers for, for ink and paper and books and firewood to help keep the classroom. And so he was not, he didn't live with William Clark. He was boarded like at an academy and uh, got a very good education. William Clark said, he was my promising boy. He had a life full of promise and William Clark recognized that early on. That's why he offered to adopt him and raise him up. So this little guy is uh, he's sharp, sharp as can be. And uh, so now Pomp gets up to about 17, 18 years old. And of course the business of the day today would be, oh, let's go into IT, right? We're gonna go into computer stuff. Well, back in this time, it was the fur trade, beaver and bison buffalo hides and beaver skins. And so he gets him a job here in um, uh, Kansas City, right on the river at a trading post. Uh, William Clark you know, is connected with all these people. So he gets Pomp, who well, that's his nickname, Jean Baptiste, he gets him a, a job at this trading post to learn the ropes and make money with trading furs and trade goods and all that. So when he's right about 17, 18 years old, this German prince, comes over from Stuttgart, Prince Paul Wilhelm of Württemberg, Germany. And he comes over and he wants to, he's read Lewis and Clark's journals. And he wants to see this American West where it disappears. He actually comes here three times. So he comes down to uh, you know, across the Atlantic, lands in New Orleans, comes up to St. Louis, knocks on William Clark's door and says, I'm Prince Paul of Württemberg. I live in Stuttgart, it's an old house, it's a castle, and uh, I read your book, I'm very interested in the American vest, and I want a passport from you, so I can go travel. So William Clark can writes him a passport. He wanted to go, he wanted to follow Lewis and Clark's trek to the Pacific. He didn't make it, he got to the Rockies and then turned around. So William Clark says, well, when you get out to Kansas, where the Kansas River comes into the Missouri, he says, there you will find my son, my adopted son. His name is Jean Baptiste. We call him Paul. They're about, he was about three, four years older than Paul. He says, I think you guys would hit it off. 
So sure enough, on his way through Kansas City, he meets with Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. And they hit it off. And then the prince continues because he hires a guide. Who does he hire as his guide to take him to the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains? Charbonneau, Jean-Baptiste's father. So Charbonneau is now guiding this German prince who's got a full entourage. He's got gunsmiths and chefs and a portable folding bed and a desk. And, you know, you've seen it before, you know, the whole crazy tons and tons of stuff. And he's shooting everything that he can see. And he's collecting Indian artifacts, beadwork and bear claw necklaces. And a lot of these great early American Indian artifacts are in European collections. Because those are the people collecting them back then. And so uh, he comes back down to St. Louis after this five-month trip to the Rockies, shooting everything, and he sees Jean Baptiste again. And he says, how are you, my little friend? Why don't you come visit me back to Germany? Yeah, I got the big house, you can live with me. We can see everything you want to see. So Jean Baptiste said, yeah, sure. So he goes down to St. Louis and, hey, dad, I'm going to Germany. And so they go down the Mississippi River, down to New Orleans, across the Atlantic, land in France, work their way overland to Germany, and he stays there for six years. He learns German, he learns French, he learns Spanish, he learns Arabic. This guy was, William Clark said, my promising young boy, full of promise. He knew he was a sharp cookie. So he's there for six years, and then finally, he wants to come home. And uh, so when he comes home, uh, it's going to be uh, 18, this trip is from 1823 to 1829. So in 1829, he says, hey, Dad, I'm back. And he says, how was your trip? And he's oh, always great. You know, Germany was wonderful. Here, I brought you a beer stein, and he lifted it up and plays music. Now, I don't know if he brought him something, but, you know, he probably brought him some little trinket or something. And so then he disappears. But now here's the interesting thing. There was a, uh, a young lady in 1998, so not all that long ago, uh, kind of a young lady who, uh, she wasn't kind of, she was a young lady in 1998. Her name is Monica Furla, F-I-R-L-A. She's a Stuttgart researcher, and she's as interested in uh, Prince Paul as I am in Lewis and Clark. So she's researching this guy because he came to the U.S. three times and kept very good journals of what he saw and recorded it very well. He was a very good amateur naturalist. So she's wanting to find out a little bit more about the prince and his life. And so uh, she starts searching around uh, these villages around Stuttgart. And in the parish records of a little church in Bad Mergentheim in Württemberg, southern Germany, she found the birth record of a boy. His name was Anton Fries, F-R-I-E-S, born February 20th, 1829. The record stated that the father was one Johann Baptiste Charbonneau of St. Louis called the American in service of Duke Paul, the mother was listed as Katerina Fries, an unmarried daughter of George Fries, a soldier at the palace. So Jean-Baptiste had a little fling with the lovely Katerina. And I'm guessing she was lovely. And uh, from that little fling, little Anton was born. Unfortunately, Anton only lives to be three months old and dies in 1829. So we don't know the exact timing that Jean-Baptiste leave when the baby died. Did he leave before? Did he even know? We don't know. There, there's some gaps there. But he comes back, and um, Katerina has never heard from again. And uh, so he's, he's now back. And now he disappears. He's like a submarine out in the, in the West. And every time he pops up, there's an event happening. So 1829 is what? It's the height of the Rocky Mountain fur trade. 1820 and 1840, basically. So he's in the height of the Rocky Mountain fur trade, beaver felt pads. So he, he's, he's known as the best man afoot in the Rocky Mountains, right up there with Jim Bridger and Jedediah Smith and all the mountain men notables. So he's really good at it. And then he kind of disappears. He shows up in, uh, in Ben's Fort. How many of you been to Ben's Fort outside of La Honda in Pueblo? He shows up there as a hunter and uh, for the fort. Uh, he's there for about three years. So there is a Lewis and Clark connection to Ben's Fort here on the front range. And then uh, he's in Taos, he's in Santa Fe. He's all over. And then come 1845, 46, he's hired by none other than Kit Carson. And Kit Carson says, I got a job. I need somebody that's, that, that's good on their feet and with tracking and finding trails across deserts and canyons and all that. And he says, I'm your man. And so he gets hired to work with Kit Carson and another mountain man from Arizona called Pauline Weaver. And what they're going to do is lead a battalion of about 400 men and six women from Santa Fe, New Mexico, 
to San Diego, California. Who is that group? I'll give you a hint. They started out in Nauvoo, Illinois. The Mormons, the Mormon Battalion. The only time in US history where we had a religious group that formed a battalion going to fight in California, Mexican-American War. So, but they need guidance. So they, they start, you know, clear up in Illinois. They, they get down to Oklahoma City and they work their way down now into uh, Santa Fe. Here's where they pick up Kit Carson, Jean Baptiste, Pauline Weaver. And from here, they drop down through the Gila Wilderness down here and they cross uh, down just a little bit north of Tucson, get over here to Yuma, cross the river here and get over to San Diego. Unfortunately, by the time they got to San Diego, the war was over, but they got them there. And uh, the whole reason for this, we don't have time to go into it, but if you've ever been to Old Town San Diego, there's a, a whole history of the Mormons coming into San Diego at this time in 1846-47. So now Jean Baptiste is there, the Mormons kind of dissipate. And the reason that they wanted to, that they signed up for this is because a lot of Mormon settlers uh, and converts were coming via ship to San Diego. And so they wanted to establish an overland route to Salt Lake City right here. And so that's why those Mormons signed up for this, because they got paid and the church took their pay and used it to establish these missions all the way along. The first mission, they, they started, maybe some of you have been there. In Spanish, it, it translates, it means the meadows or the, the natural springs. Uh, we know it today as Las Vegas. <laughs> Anybody been to that old Mormon settlement, Las Vegas? <laughs> it's changed a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that's a whole other story. And so anyway, Jean Baptiste finds himself down here in San Diego, and he's been paid, but he's out of money. I mean, he's out of work. And so he's kind of looking around, like, well, what can I do here? So after a couple months of bouncing around, he gets a job. Uh, you know, the Franciscans had a series of about 20, 21 missions all the way up the California coast. You know, Father Kino and Esteban and all that. And so he gets a job at the Mission San Luis Rey. Anybody been to Oceanside, San Diego? It's about four miles from Oceanside. Beautiful Franciscan mission. It was thousands of acres. It had about six, seven acres under the roof. You know, just an amazing agricultural enclave there uh, run by the you know, local Franciscan priests and the ranchero owners. And most of their workers were the Luciano people, the San Diego native tribes. And so Jean Baptiste gets a job there as the alcalde, which is like the mayor, magistrate, judge, jury, executioner. You know, it's, it covers a broad realm of uh, duties. And they think he's going to be good for it because he's really smart, but they don't take into consideration that he's half Indian himself. And he can see these Indians are getting the short end of the stick. They're, they're like, oh, they're sold to the company store. They're never going to get out of this poverty. And so he lets a lot of things slide. And the powers that be said, you're out. And it was one of those... I quit, you're fired kind of scenarios. He, he, he walks after just under a year. He couldn't take it anymore. So now the year is 1848, going into the winter of 1848 and 1849. Let's see, California, 1849. Another German settler by the name of Johann Sutton. He starts a sawmill up on the Amer South Fork American River, up by Sacramento area, and Boom, gold rush, California 49ers. So here we come. So Jean Baptiste and his business partner at this time, uh, they head up here to Sacramento and they work up and they end up uh, working in the gold fields. But then uh, he's getting older. So he says, you know what? I'm getting too old for this kind of work. I'm going to get bushwhacked out here. So he gets a job in Auburn, California at the Orleans Hotel. And that hotel stood until about 1970 when a railroad easement came through and they had to take the hotel down. But he worked there for 15 years as a front desk clerk. He kept the light on for the miners. And so uh, he was working there and uh, he would write letters for people because you know, the 49ers that came in, they just weren't from California. They were from all over the world. Just like the Alaska gold rushes, they came from Norway. They came from everywhere. And so some of them were real literate. So he'd write letters for them back to home saying, you know, I made it. I haven't struck it rich yet, but I'm here. You know, so you would make a little side money there. So then in 1861, you know, civil war is starting to brew up and uh, the gold rush is uh, starting to peter out. Things are happening in the American West. And so Jean Baptiste decides that he's going to move on to another area. And there had just been gold rushes up in Virginia City, Montana. 
And also up uh, just outside of Lewiston, Idaho, uh, there's a place called Orofino, which means fine gold in Spanish. And that town's about 40 miles to the east of Lewiston, Idaho. And so he and his couple buddies, they decide we're going to go, we're going to work our way up across southern Oregon and up into Idaho and the Snake River country and hit the gold mines up there. And we'll do the same thing we did up there. You know, we'll make some money up there. We'll, we'll mine the miners and make money selling stuff to the miners at an inflated rate. So as he is crossing the Owyhee River in, uh, in southeast Oregon here, uh, his horse stumbles and he falls into the Owyhee River. This is all snow melt. So it's really cold and he literally caught his death of cold. And so he dies about two weeks later at a local ranch called the Inskip Station. If you go there today in the Jordan Valley, all there are is uh, it's kind of like going to Bowie or Somerset, you know, it's just foundations, you know, for the most part, not a whole lot there. But uh, there is a, the uh, local historical group put up a nice uh, stone cairn with logs and a nice big monument that says, here lies Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. You know, the babe born in February, Fort Mandan, 1805, went to the Pacific, lived an amazing life in Europe, was well loved by everyone, uh, amazing individual, and here he lies to this day. So he's not buried in Wyoming next to his 100 year old mother and a unknown brother. He's buried right there in, in the Southeast Oregon. Now, one other one I want, I want to cover two more. Are we okay for two more? Yeah, because that, that's that'll be it. Um, we got to talk about York. You know, what happens with York? You know, we, we, I've told you what happened to a lot of these other guys. Well, here York comes, you know, when they're mustering out the, the expedition. And uh, York walks up to the table and says, Sir, what do I get? How much pay? How much land? And he said, um, I don't get what you're talking about. He says, What do you mean, uh, pay and land? You're, you're my servant. You're a slave. You don't get any pay. You don't get any land. It's back to work as usual for you. Now, he was a house servant, he wasn't a field hand. And remember, I said, when they got back to St. Louis, he said, My man, York cannot wait to put on a linen shirt, new trousers, silk hose, and pumps. You know, York was used to finer things than he had on this, you know, greasy buckskin trip. And so York is kind of thinking, well, but I carried a gun. That was not, that was frowned upon. You know, slaves did not, were not allowed to have guns. And so, but he hunted, he participated in every aspect of the expedition, and he felt himself to be pretty much an equal. And I think rightly so. Uh, he even got to choose where they would spend their winter camp. He and Chicago Wea got to, you know, they tallied their, their vote, so to speak, when they said, do you want to stay on this side of the river or that side of the river? Well, let's go over there. You know, so they, they weighed in on some events and, and were, were respected for their opinions. So now here he is, and now it's back to business as usual. And so York uh, will work for William Clark for a couple more years. But Clark says, you know what? He's just taken this notion of freedom just too far. And he says, if he keeps pestering me about it, I'm going to sell him off to the, the sugarcane fields, you know, down in the Caribbean, which was a death sentence. You know, he says, if you don't, you know, mind your P's and Q's here, pal, you know, life's not going to go well for you. York was married. We know this because when they got back uh, to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, York was given one week to go see his wife because York had a painted buffalo robe for him. And he had some souvenirs that he brought back. And so he, we only had a week, he stayed a month, and William Clark was not too pleased that he's went, you know, AWOL for three additional weeks. And, uh, but we know that York was married. Now, again, it was illegal for slaves to be married. But how did they signify being married in slave culture? Jump the broom. And so while they were sitting there sweeping, you know, the plantation walkways and steps, and they had a young man and young gal that were sweet on each other, and they'd say they'd look around and make sure no, you know, the master wasn't watching. And then they would hold the broom down, and two people would hold the broom, and the couple would hold hands, jump over the broom, and in the slave community, they were married by jumping the broom. Because something they could use, it just no, I just sweep, I dropped my broom, they stepped over it. I'm sorry. You know, it was something you could you know you could explain it away pretty easily. So York was married. As far as we know, he never gets reunited with his wife because they were owned by two different families. Don't know about any kids either. He probably had some, but we don't know. And so at this point, uh, finally, in about 18, ooh, 30, 32, 33, uh, William Clark has kind of had enough. 
of York, uh, not in a bad way, but he says, you know, it's just, uh, it's not worth my effort anymore. So he, he lets York go. And when he does, uh, he doesn't cut him loose. He buys him a freight wagon and a team and four horses. And puts him in the trucking business, freighting business. Now, does York know how to do this? He's a, remember, he's a house servant. He's not a field hand. He's not a horseman. He's not a teamster. And so, but William Clark says, well, I'm going to set you up in business. Because William Clark had businesses between Louisville and St. Louis. So he said, hey, you know, set you up in a little delivery route. Well, he couldn't read. It was illegal for them to read. So how could he collect bills and do arithmetic and add up CODs and all that kind of thing? It was, it was impossible. So in a very short order, that business was defunct. The wagon fell apart. Horses came up lame. And York comes back to Clark and says, please take me back. I was foolish to ever, you know, want to wander away. I just can't hack it. And uh, Clark says, sorry, you're on your own. So the, Clark kept a little book like this of all the expedition members, killed or died. And whenever he heard, you know, people come back to St. Louis from being out west, he was kind of the focal point. Everybody stopped at York at uh, Clark's house to add to his big Western map, add details, change them, make addendums. And, he, and they'd say, oh, did you hear about George Juillard? They died of the three forks at the hands of the Blackfeet. Well, okay, Juillard died. What year was that? And that was just last spring. Okay, duly noted. So he kept a running tally of expedition members. So he has York dead about 1832. Now, York's buried in two places, too. One has him dying in Tennessee in a ditch of cholera. The other one has him when he got his walking papers from William Clark. He went back out here to live among the, uh, the Northern Cheyenne as a war chief. And because York, being a black man, these Native Americans had never seen a black white man before. They didn't, they didn't know what to make of him. They'd never seen an African American. There's a great Charles Russell painting of uh, in a Mandan lodge, and the Indian chiefs are you know, getting their fingers wet and they're going to York. They're going like this, trying to, because they think it's war paint. They go, we got to get, boy, this guy's really went in for the black war paint, you know? And then they thought, well, look at, look at his hair, the way it's all crinkled down. He obviously fell into a fire and was burned. But look at how strong he is. York was a robust individual. And uh, it's interesting to note that at the beginning of the expedition, uh, they did a walk on the Great Plains, a hot, humid August day, up to a place called Spirit Mound, where the local people told them there were 18 inch tall, little demon, gnome, leprechaun, crazy little people. That if you went up on that Spirit Mound, they would, like piranhas, they just chew you right down to the bones and never be seen again. So William Clark says, let's go up there and check it out. See if we can find these little 18 inch demons. So they went up there, and there's nothing but grasshoppers and way too many mosquitoes on a very hot August day. And, and the dog almost died of heat stroke. And York, William Clark writes, my man York had, had to make a beeline for the creek to just fall in the creek because he was exhausted from the heat because he is chubby. So this is the beginning of the trip. This is August, four months into the trip. So he was out of shape, like some of the other guys probably were too. But let me tell you, by the end of the trip, ain't nobody was out of shape. You know, they were all lean, mean, fighting machines, so to speak. And so York has been, you know, portrayed in a lot of sculptures now. And he looks like he's a lineman for the Green Bay Packers, you know. And uh, so he's always portrayed differently in different times of history, you know, through American history, through 200 years of history. So York, it's, uh, there's a, a black a mountain man by the name of James Beckworth who said, uh, I was up among the, the Northern Cheyenne. And they told me that they had a black war chief that was lived among them for many years and he finally died with them and his name was York. So I would like to choose that end for York than dying of cholera in a ditch along the road in Tennessee somewhere. So that's, um, that's the name that I'm gonna finish up with like my last one, okay? This one's really good and because uh, it's my favorite one. I always keep it till last. And it's this journal that I have, you know, that I showed you, Patrick Gass. He's the one that wrote this, okay? So Patrick Gass, he gets out of the expedition and instead of just resigning, he re-ups in the military. He's a bachelor, he's got nothing to lose. So the next thing he knows, he's up at um, Niagara Falls fighting the British in the War of 1812. 
And uh, he's there at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, British musket ball, hits the stock of his gun, shatters splinters, he gets splinters in his eye, loses his sight in one eye. No big deal, he's still got a good eye. So then after the War of 1812, he goes back down to Wheeling, Virginia. Uh, he's living there. He works as a, um, a ferry operator, a brewery. Oh, he loved the brewery job. Um, he also uh, operated at a, at a grist mill. He had a variety of jobs, but he was the carpenter, right? He could build anything. He built all those three forts, 10,000 logs, all cut and finished and to make those three forts. So he was a master carpenter. And so Patrick Gass, uh, he's in the Wheeling, Virginia area, and he gets a job to build a barn for a farmer. And the farmer's name is Mr. Hamilton. And now Patrick is 60 years old. The year here is 1831. And he marries and at 60 in 1831. Because farmer Hamilton has a lovely young daughter, Maria. She's 17. Patrick is 60. So he must have been in pretty good shape. And uh, you know, pretty handsome guy. And uh, but their eyes fell upon each other, and it was love at first sight. And so Patrick wants to do the right thing. So he calls Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton over, and he says, uh, "You may have noticed I've uh, cast my eye upon your daughter, and uh, I want to do the right thing. And I'm sorry, I'd be beholden to you if you allow me to marry your daughter." And Farmer Hamilton is just like, "What?" And uh, Mrs. Hamilton steps right up and she goes, absolutely not, due to the disparity of your ages. Be gone. And so Patrick left and took Maria with him. And, he left. <laughs> and they started having a family, had seven kids, bang, 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 bang. And uh, in 1845, 46, after seven children are born, Maria passes away from complications from the measles. So now Patrick is 75, and he's got these little kids around, some no bigger, but he's got six kids. One died, but he's got these six kids. He's 75. And then when uh, they're only married 15 years. So then uh, in 1861, he is now 90. Now what's happening in 1861, Virginia? Civil War is gearing up. And so Patrick, he's been a career soldier. He's a real handy guy. So Patrick grabs his gun at 90, goes down to the recruiter's station, and he goes, Patrick Gass here, with Lewis and Clark, fought four to on six, fought the war 1812, lost an eye, battled up lane, got married, got a bunch of kids, wife died, well, fight them ribs, I need the money. He said, uh, how, old, how old are you, sir? And he goes, I'm 90, what's that got to do you with the shuffle? I can still see dies out of the stake at 100 years They said, well, sir, we appreciate your, your enthusiasm and your patriotism, but uh, you're a little old for what we're looking for here in recruit material. And so Patrick turns on his heel and walks away disgusted that they didn't take him seriously. And it was not a prank. He was dead serious. He was ready to go. But that event in today's parlance went viral. Local papers got a hold of it. People wrote about him and said, hey, Give this guy a break. Look at all the service he's given to his country. He lost his eye. His wife dies. And now at 90, he's ready to fight again. And so they got his, his pension raised. He died at 99 years old. The oldest surviving member of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And here's a photo of him. Now, here's a perfect example when you do research that you can't believe everything you even get from museums and archives. Because he died in 1871. And it says, this is Patrick Gass, last survivor of the Lewis and Clark expedition, 1875. He looks pretty good for four years dead. <laughs> and so uh, here's a picture of Patrick Gass if you want to pass that around. But it, it's, it was probably, if I could have interviewed anybody on the expedition, I think it would have been Patrick Gass, just because he was just so dang practical and just a likable guy. So anyway. Thank you so much. You have been a tremendous audience. I appreciate it. Please do, and have a wonderful day. And I hope to do some more of these for you in the future. I've got lots more up my sleeve. Thank you.